So about 20 years ago, Bill Cheswick and I wrote the very first book on firewalls and internet security. Came out with a second edition 11 years ago, by which point I was starting to have very serious doubts about whether or not firewalls were actually still good for anything. Uh, a few years, in between the two books, I published a paper where I called firewalls obsolescent. So are firewalls still good, useful, and how, and why? So what's a firewall? We all know what a firewall is. It's a barrier in the network between us and them, whoever them are. And the firewall's got this magic property. It lets good things in and keeps bad things out. <coughs> the usual analogy is to, uh, at the border, to passport control or customs. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, from Jordan a few, my last trip here, uh, crossed the uh, border and I lot to go, went to go visit Petra. So this is from Jordan looking back at Israel. Very interesting. I had a lot of very interesting observations on security at that border, but that's a separate story. <laughs> uh, so firewalls have been with, around commercially for about 20 years. Occasionally, people who think I invented the firewall know that's not at all correct. I really describe, uh, work, did work on some of the early ones, but don't, not, not even the first ones. But I did describe, Bill Cheswick and I did describe them 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, 1994, is about when the web started to take off. One, the very, one of the very last changes that Bill and I made to this book before we sent off the final postscript to be printed, we added one paragraph on this new protocol called HTTP and the World Wide Web. And we declined a suggestion that we use URLs to represent the location of certain resources. Who, who, who'd ever write something like that? But the, the point is that the commercial internet basically grew up together with firewalls. Virtually all companies use firewalls. There's only one problem. They don't work very well these days. Modern networks do not match the assumptions that are behind firewalls. And then the question is, is there something we can do? Can we still use this technology and get some benefit out of it? Or should we just say, let's not bother. They're just getting in our way and not providing any proper, any real protective benefit at all. What is the right strategy to use for corporate defense, for organizational defense? And again, I was talking about assumptions. Let's look back 20 years. Laptops were quite rare 20 years ago. Some people used them. I used them. But they were quite rare. Wi-Fi as a technology didn't even exist. Hotel broadband networks were non-existent. 20 years ago, you were lucky if you stayed in a hotel that had two phone lines, one for your laptop and one for making calls. I, I used to travel with a little phone jack and a screwdriver, so if I needed to, I could go unscrew the phone wires from the wall and, can, and add my own jack so I could plug in my laptop. I haven't had to do that in a very long time. But you dialed in and you logged into a remote shell account on some remote computer. And you connect into your corporate network, and there was a firewall. But that firewall was basically for inbound and outbound mail and FTP, and just starting to be HTTP. And there were very few, if any, corporate links, company-to-company -company links over the internet. It was too new and too unreliable a technology to be used in this fashion. And as I said, even the web was very, very new. 
But this was the era in which firewalls first became prominent because there were, even then, attacks on the internet. You know, the Morris War was in 1988, even many other attacks. People joke that Bill and I were behind some of the attacks to go stir up sales for our book. No, that wasn't true. Today, a large company will have at least hundreds and possibly thousands of links that bypass the firewall. Direct link, direct IP links to other companies, encrypted channels between companies, connections that you allow through the firewall for one reason or another. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I'd say, the internet is becoming the data equivalent of the telephone network. There's no becoming anymore, it is. Many people work from home, officially or unofficially, telecommuting, they call it. And there are many, many more services and email that are needed. Laptops, tablets, smartphones, everybody has them. Israel was one of the first countries in the world where there were more mobile phones than people. It's now not at all uncommon in most phones these days. I suspect that virtually everyone in this room is carrying a smartphone. And often employees are using their own equipment, the whole bring your own device movement. And I hate to use the word, I use the analogy of border control, I hate to use the word tunnel in this context, but it is the correct word. We used it in the firewalls book 20 years ago. You can carry one protocol within another. You can call, it's called tunneling. It's, uh, and I can set up what looks like it from the port number to be an HTTP connection. Oh, port 80 or port 443 for encrypted HTTP. And I can carry IP on top of it and set up a virtual link that way. Getting out through the corporate firewall in a way they can't look inside because it's all encrypted. I gave a lecture, oh, mid-90s, about internet security, internet technology internet security to the NSA about 20 years ago. I said, how do you know if this connection is really HTTP or IP masquerading as it? That's traffic analysis. You people are better at it than I am. But we also use the internet for external links, virtual private networks, VPNs, through the firewall to some other computer. And even apart from the hundreds or thousands of authorized links through the firewall, there are often many more. I once asked one of the top security people at a large company, how many authorized connections do you have through your firewall? He thought for a moment and said, probably 500. To vendors, suppliers, joint venture partners, customers, 500 holes punched in the firewall. And since we were private, I said to him, and how many more links do you think exist that you don't know about? Probably another 500. Sometimes it would be an employee doing stuff maliciously. Sometimes some small business unit off in a remote corner of the company, someone would say, you know, we need a link to carry out our part of the job. And you go set up a link without bothering to go through all the bureaucracy that corporate security wanted. So his estimate was that there were another 500. It's as many as the official ones. So we have these tunnels bypassing the firewall. So what is the purpose of a firewall? Is it apart from keeping the bad guys away from the buggy code, the line I used earlier, the purpose of a firewall is to enforce a security policy. It is a centralized way to enforce a security policy. If your security policy says that only that machine over there can run a web server accessible from the outside, and you don't want to have to go check every machine in the company to see what happens to be on port 80 or port 8080 or what have you, and do this every day. You put up a firewall that says, port 80 only to that machine over there. A firewall is a device for enforcing a policy. And by the way, there's a corollary. If you don't have a policy, there's no point to a firewall. 
every year or two, my department has some security incident. And every time that happens, the head of the computing support group, the department, comes to me and says, Steve, we have to put up a firewall, a really strict firewall. I say, Daisy, what's the policy you're going to enforce? What do you mean? What are you going to allow through? Well, I don't know, then there's no point to a firewall. The firewall enforces a policy. If you don't have a policy, the firewall won't do you anything, any good. Another point of the firewall, this goes back to the buggy code problem, is that the early firewalls were much simpler, much smaller code base than the protocols they were protecting. They weren't trying to pass very many protocols. Email, FTP, maybe early HTTP, Telnet, but not a lot else. There weren't very many protocols that, were, that existed, let alone were of interest on the internet. So anything you didn't want to pass, you didn't need to have code for. So you had a small, simple code base, and smaller and simpler is another way of saying more correct and hence more secure. So the firewall was actually doing something. Simple policy, simple code. When we look at a firewall analytically, there are three properties that it has to have, that ha three properties that have to exist for a firewall actually to be beneficial. First of all, it's got to be at a topological choke point. All traffic has to pass through this one point, or maybe that three firewalls, three points. Firewall, traffic that does not pass through this choke point is not protected by the firewall, so the firewall is not providing any benefit. The nodes, the computer systems on the inside of the firewall, generally speaking, have to share the same security policy. Why, if you have too many different security policies on the, uh, on the inside, then the firewall administration and maintenance gets to be far too complex, or you have to allow something for one group of nodes that's dangerous to another. So this group of computers over here wants to do a large variety of UDP services. For reasons I won't go into now, UDP is not a pleasant protocol to firewall. Not designed for it. OK, so I've got to go open up a whole pile of port numbers for UDP for these computers over there. Those computers over there don't need UDP, in fact, might be endangered by it being open. Which do you do? Oh, and now this computer over here is part of this group over there. I have to go change the rules. Or that one is migrated this way, and now it's an exception to those rules over there. It, get, it gets too complicated. You can't manage it. You can't keep track of it. You really want a fairly similar security policy. I have a whole lab full of uh, ordinary desktops, great. They're all doing about the same thing. Another room full of web servers, they're doing about the same thing. Two firewalls would be simpler than two different policies on one. The third property of the firewall is that everybody on the inside should be a good guy. Everybody on the outside is, if not a bad guy, at least untrusted. And this is what, these properties are what firewalls rely on to be effective even in theory. Never mind how good the code is. These are the, prop the abstract properties that have to exist. None of them hold particularly well today. There are too many links through or around the firewall, those hundreds of links I was talking about. There are mobile devices that go back and forth. The phones, the laptops, the tablets, the what have you. They exist on the outside of the firewall. They exist on the inside. In 2002, there was a uh, worm that spread very rapidly called Code Red. Now, Code Red attacked Microsoft web servers. It's the sort of thing that should not have gotten through any properly designed, properly administered firewall. Because you don't put your web server on the inside. You put it in the so-called DMZ, demilitarized zone. I don't know of a single large company that did not have Code Red on the inside. 
Something was clearly wrong even in 2002. And what was it? Well, I happened to be at the I at an IETF meeting in London in 2002 while Code Red was at its peak. So I spent 20 minutes, I wrote a little script, ran on my laptop, listened on port 80, and logged anything that looked like a Code Red attempt. There were about a dozen machines coming from the IETF wireless network <coughs> that were clearly infected with Code Red, trying to attack my laptop on the IETF network. And that was already one very big clue. First of all, why was a laptop running a web server? Well, there were reasons for it, won't go into it, but they were. Could have been some other service that they're supposed to run. But every one of these laptops was either connecting back over a VPN to the corporate network while they're there and it's bringing the infection inside, or at the very worst, we're going to go home the following week and bring the infection inside. So property one doesn't hold. Property two, well, policies. We have so many different kinds of computers today, very specialized ones. We don't have any rational, simple set of policies. So property two is not holding very well. And property three about good guys, everyone on the inside being a good guy. We have so many computers on the inside these days that probably some are infected at any given time. In fact, the existence of mobile code, Java, JavaScript, and so on. Some of the stuff with Flash and QuickTime means that your computer, following your computer security policy, is quite capable of downloading and executing code that, from the perspective of your network, is malicious and doing nasty things. There's an example I, I won't go into the details of, but oh, about 15 years old, involving Java. And Java was designed with a pretty rational network security policy. You download a Java applet, it can call back to the site that it came from, but no other site. Well, it can call back on any protocol, including FTP. And FTP protocols got certain peculiar properties under certain circumstances. A high-end firewall will open up another hole in the firewall on behalf of FTP, which is a perfectly safe thing to do if you only have good guys on the inside of your network. But now I download this Java applet. It calls home using FTP and issues the FTP subcommand that says open up another hole in the firewall. It's not a bad user. The user's doing what is permissible, running a Java applet. The Java applet is doing what's permissible according to the Java security policy, phoning home. The firewall is helping the inside users by handling FTP properly. But the applet was malicious and acting as a bad actor inside the firewall and opening up other holes in the firewall. We have bad actors on the inside of the firewall today. So it looks like I'm saying that firewalls are absolutely useless. But in fact, that's not quite correct. They still can work in special cases where these three properties hold. So let's imagine a single machine where the firewall is a layer of code someplace in the network stack, say between the network stack and the applications since most of the attacks are against applications. In fact, there are a, lot of, a lot of the so-called personal firewalls work exactly this way. So it's not, I don't even have to imagine the technology, it exists. Does this do anything for us? One question is, where does the security policy come from? If the central administration of the company can ship out the policy, then I, lo and behold, I've suddenly got a very good firewall. What's on, the what's on the inside of this firewall? My applications. 
that computer over there inside my company is infected, not a problem. It's not on the inside of my firewall. It can't attack me. One policy, the topological choke point, the network stack. Only good guys on the inside, for the most part, except for these weird cases like the Java app that I mentioned. So I've got this strange case. It seems like a weird one, but it actually works, where a firewall-like technology can succeed. The, there are only two little catches. One, where does the policy come from? Well, it turns out we know how to build tools to go ship a file around to every computer in an organization. Any large-scale system administration group does that routinely anyway. Shipping out antivirus uh, definitions, shipping out new patches, shipping out a firewall policy. So we know how to do that part of it. The only little problem I have left is I don't really know who the other good guys are, who the other trusted machines are. Turns out you can solve that with, you use cryptography properly, I won't go into details, but at least we have an existence proof. It's possible to use firewall-like technology in a certain special case. So, general case says firewalls don't seem to work, but I have an existence proof that says, under certain circumstances, I can make them work. So someplace in between, there's a line. I can use firewalls up to this point, but not further. No, it's not quite time to throw them out yet. So let's extend the firewall a little bit to what I call a departmental firewall. Relatively small sub-organization within a company. Maybe it's a small company or a small sub-organization within a large one. Well, a particular department in a company usually doesn't have large numbers of links to the outside. You know, here's the port on the router from my VLAN. Great. If the port fails, I call, call the IT department, they repair it. I don't need redundant connectivity. But this means I've got the topological choke point. Property one connectivity through a choke point holds. This is by definition a small organization, relatively uniform set of computers and uses because the department is doing more or less one thing. What does this mean? This means that property two holds. I've got a common policy, much more likely. And there aren't, again, by definition, aren't going to be very many machines on the inside. It's not a huge sort of organization. I'll come back to mobile devices a little bit, a, bit, a little bit later. But property three seems to hold as well. None of these are perfect, except maybe property one, the topology. But for a department within, you know, tens of people, maybe even a hundred people, a firewall suddenly seems to be useful again. And this means that I can very effectively use this firewall to protect comparatively low-value resources within the department, like the printer. I don't want some random person running me out of toner or paper. Hey, you know, when I started in computing, back in the world of mainframes, and computer time was very expensive. We had to pay for every second of compute time. Computers became, we used. Computers became a lot cheaper. That's a fairly preposterous notion today, except in cloud servers, thank you. But, uh, you know, I, the University Computer Center, one of the real consumables is paper that's printed, because they pay for every sheet of paper that's printed. So you charge people for paper printed. My own academic department <coughs> had this problem because the university gave the undergraduate students a limit, I think it was 20 pages a week. People discovered the computer science department had these wide open printers. They'd wander into the building. Command P, print, control P, print. Oh, there you go, pull this paper off the printer. We had to go lock down our printers. 
firewall can protect that from the outside. People want to go print first, then come in to pick up their output. We can generalize this. I call this a point firewall. Put a small, simple firewall, like a packet filter, in front of a resource that can't protect itself. I bought a new printer for my house lately. I said, oh great, it has IPv6, courtesy of a tunnel to a friend's uh, rack in a data center. I've got IPv6 to my house, very convenient for me. Turn on IPv6 to my printer. Then I realized that that printer has got no access controls on its IPv6 interface. It meant that anybody on the internet who knew its IP address or its domain name, it's listed in the printer's list, listed in the DNS, thank you, could go print to my printer. Uh, I don't think so. I don't even know if this printer would be particularly good about uh, rejecting malicious firmware updates. I don't think so. So no, I turned off IPv6 about two minutes after I turned it on. <laughs> A firewall that blocked v6 connectivity to that printer would be quite sufficient if the printer didn't have that particular option. Again, the policy is very simple. My family and my guests can print. Nobody else can. If I let you on my LAN, you can print. Or, here is the web server. Well, the purpose of a web server is to serve up ports 80 and 443, HTTP, HTTPS. That web server may have other ports open. It's always an amusing exercise to take a computer out of the box, turn it on, and see what port it's actually listening on. The answer, far more than you understand why, or quite possibly far more than you want. This is a web server. Its purpose is only to go serve 80 and 443. I put a simple packet filter in front of that web server that blocks everything else. Do I have risks coming in from the back end, as I mentioned earlier? Sure. It's a separate issue involving separate defenses, as I will come back to. But these point firewalls still meet all three properties. One policy, topological choke point, only good guys on the inside. So this class of firewall is, if anything, more useful than it was 20 years ago. There's another limitation of firewalls. It's a bit more subtle, but not new. Uh, you know, Bill and I talked about it 20 years ago. Firewalls do not provide protection at any layers of the stack other than the ones at which they operate. <laughs> firewalls will operate at certain layers. Different classes of firewalls, different types will operate at different layers. A comprehensive modern firewall will operate at many different layers of the stack for this reason. But a simple packet filter is going to be pretty lousy at virus scanning. Again, this is not absurd. We wrote 20 years ago that you, if you ran an organization that ran PCs, PCs were not on the internet in 1994. Microsoft didn't ship TCP IP until Windows 95, <laughs> after the book came out. We said, if you're running an organization with lots of network PCs, you probably want a virus scanning mail gateway in your firewall. Can't do that with a packet filter. On the other hand, a mail proxy is not going to do a particularly good job at looking at ARP spoofing, because that's a down at layer two, and here you're operating at layer seven. So you need to tune your firewalls appropriately. There's another limitation, a little bit more subtle. Firewalls do not do a particularly good job of sanitizing and filtering a permitted protocol. Not today. 20 years ago, they could sometimes do it, but not today. So, HTTP. My web server has to run HTTP. Except that's its job. If I'm going to block port 80 to a web server, I may as well turn off the web server and save myself the trouble. Then I'm going to stick a firewall in front of it to go filter out nasty HTTP requests. Okay, why do I, th in modern HTTP is a very complex protocol, why do I think that the firewall is doing a better job, in general, of rejecting nasty HTTP than the web server itself? Oh, a few special cases. 
URLs cannot be longer than 1024 bytes. Okay, great. We've seen that in requirements documents. Modern requirements documents must do, tend to say and must reject longer lines. So the test group will spot that. Usually. Not always. Usually. But why do I think it can filter it better? It probably can't filter it well enough to exclude most attacks. Worse yet, it's probably going to exclude stuff that's valid by being overly strict on certain things. In general today, with rare exceptions, a content-driven attack like viruses, protocols that you permit through have to defend themselves. The protocols are too complicated, and if the firewall is trying to really handle the protocol comprehensively, its code is just as likely to be buggy as the web server, the mail server, the what have you server. Once upon a time, firewall code was small and simple. That's not true anymore. A modern firewall can handle 200 different protocols. That's probably more than most of the hosts it's protecting or handling. That means it's more vulnerable than the hosts. And as I said, you need filtering at all levels of the stack, but that's more code complexity and hence the chance for much more insecurity. So I've established that just doing the job, even if the topology was right, even all three properties are correct, a firewall is not going to provide high protection today. So someplace between point firewalls and the corporate firewall, there's still this gap. And now let's add in the threat model that I was talking about this morning. The four different classes of attackers. The joy hackers, the targeteers, the opportunistic attackers, and, and uh, the Andromedans. Does that change my conclusion about whether or not firewalls are useful? And the answer is yes. So let's start with the joy hackers. The unsophisticated script kiddies who are going after anything that they can get. Drawing the holes around the bullet hole, the circles around the bullet holes. Well, the policies are relatively common to block these people because these people are basically vandals. They're causing mischief and nobody's got a policy that's going to allow this kind of stuff to come through. Oh. That virus again? Why do I want to allow it through? It's not a new virus. It's been in the uh, virus definition file since 1987. Why do I want to allow it through? Forcing email and maybe web traffic through a proxy server that filters out known malware is a strong and successful defense against this class of attacker because they're not inventing new stuff. They can cause damage if you're not careful. But this class of application level firewall filtering still does a good job. Network scanning by, you know, off the shelf scanning tools. Oh, here's this Nmap thingy. Let me click to scan this network. Cool, I see what it does. A firewall will protect against them. An enterprise firewall with its 200 protocols and multi-level, uh, multi-layer of the stack scanning will provide protection against this class of joy hacker. And because they can cause trouble if you're not careful, the corporate firewall is still a good defense against this class of attacker. So yes, there is still some value in the corporate firewall because you have a large company, you cannot assume that all of your thousands of employees are going to get the behavioral patterns correct. So the guard at the front gate still works. Opportunistic attackers, it's a harder choice. Again, they're going after anybody but with relatively sophisticated attack. Maybe they'll be stopped, maybe they won't, but a good one will find and exploit these policy differences. They might also uh, infect external links 
talk more about that in a little bit, we still have some benefit, but, but a lot less. The opportunistic attacker might be able to get through. They might hack your partner. It's hard to say if Target was hit by an opportunistic attacker or, uh, or someone who was targeting them and, and was very skilled. But according to news reports, they were penetrated through their uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning company. No, they didn't want to go shut down the air conditioning in the Target stores, but this company had links to Target's corporate network and, got it, and apparently or allegedly got in that way through an external link that was being allowed through the firewall. So we have a lot, we have less benefit here, but not none. The targeteers are not particularly stopped by the firewall. Again, they're often insiders, so they're on the inside of the firewall. We have lost property two, the, I'm sorry, property three. On the inside, we don't have only good guys anymore. They may come in through a link to a, from another company. They have done their research. They're targeting you. They know what the links are, the behavior patterns are. They're sending Spear phishing emails targeting people in particular because of known behavior patterns. You know, when I was a graduate student, any time a note in green ink appeared on the bulletin board, we knew it was from the chair of the department. That was just his custom. Think of the electronic equivalent. When I was at the Fe U.S. Federal Trade Commission, there was one person who was regularly sending me email, and she just had something that looked like elegant blue stationery for the background on all her email. I just glanced at that and I knew who it was from without even reading uh, the from line. And if I got mail purporting to be from her without that background, I might be suspicious. A target here would know this. Firewalls are not going to work particularly well unless your other policies and mechanisms are very strong. It might help a little, but a lot less, especially if they're an insider. And then there's the Andromedans and the equivalent. Firewalls don't help at all. Just a little bit of a speed bump along the way between the outside and the inside. They can get in. They can go send a spear phishing email, targeted malware, a virus that's not picked up by the scanners because they just created it and it's not any of the virus definition tables. But these are the people we have to worry about most. These are the ones who are really after our serious corporate uh, assets. And firewalls aren't helping at all. Again, we've got Stuxnet. Now, that's an extreme example. But Stuxnet got across an air gap. You know, a few years ago, I'd give a talk where I'd say, here is the really secure firewall. And the picture was a pair of wire cutters. Create the air gap. Well. Air gaps don't work against a suitably skilled, suitably determined, well-resourced attacker. We now have a worked example of that. So the Andromedans are going to get in through the firewall. We need other kinds of defenses. Maybe we want the firewall as well. In fact, we do for, our, for the lesser classes of attackers. But it's not going to be any noticeable hindrance to the really serious ones. So my favorite example there was uh, Lockheed. RSA, which makes these little secure ID tokens I'll talk about tomorrow, these time-based authentication tokens, was hacked allegedly by Chinese government-sponsored hackers who stole something exactly what was never disclosed, though I have my theories. And Lockheed claims that Information stolen from RSA was used to get into Lockheed. As I've written, the attackers had to have more information, more skills than just that. But this was a group of very sophisticated attackers, probably with the government behind them, going after defense information. So firewalls. Enterprise firewalls of the sort I described 20 years ago still have value, but significantly less. They're especially bad against the more serious kinds of attackers, 
the ones that caused the most damage to us. So we need other layers of defense to deal with this extra, with the newer kinds of failures. But the point firewalls are still extremely valuable in certain situations. And one situation where they really help, it turns out, is this very troublesome matter of the authorized external links through your firewall. So how do these things work? Very often these days, and there, there are variants, I'll leave those as an exercise for you. Very often, these external links, they're coming in over a VPN connection from some outside partner company to your company, the firewall allows the VPN through, and then there's some connection through your corporate internet to some resource that these people are allowed to get to. So the situation that I suggest looks a bit like this. We have the partner company, VPN, across the internet, through your firewall, across the corporate internet, but now I'm going to do things a little bit differently than is conventionally done. I'm going to put in another firewall between the intranet and what I call this an enclave, a shared enclave. And I terminate the VPN inside this second firewall. And inside this second firewall is where I put the resource that the outside partner needs to get at. And what's unusual here is that this second firewall is facing the other direction. It is protecting the rest of your company from the shared resource. Again, let's take another look at it. The outside party, whom you don't fully trust, has access to this resource. Maybe they're going to try to do nasty things from here, or maybe they've been hacked. This is the HVAC provider, the air conditioning company. They've been hacked. Whoever hacked them has now hacked this resource and wants to attack your company. But they can't because this firewall is not letting them through. From the perspective of your company, this is just as dangerous just as much untrusted as this, the internet. The VPN, by the way, I say encrypted, but you know, it doesn't have to be encrypted. It's not easy to eavesdrop on the internet backbone or to deflect traffic on the internet backbone. Not impossible. There are a number of ways to do it especially if you're dealing with more serious levels of attackers, you might have to worry about the cryptography there. You know, but this partner isn't sitting in a hot spot in a Starbucks. It's their corporate network. You don't need a lot of crypto there. It doesn't hurt, but it's not defending against most classes of threats. Some, but not most. And then you need one extra set of policies. This is a shared resource. So some group of people within your company, within your intranet, have to get at this resource as well. And either they're located within this enclave or they're passing through the firewall in this direction to get to this resource. So this is a different way to use firewalls than we commonly see. We are not protecting this resource from the rest of the company necessarily. We're protecting the rest of the company from this resource. What, what kind of firewall? Is this a simple packet filter or a big checkpoint or picks? That's going to depend on exactly what you need to pass through it. That's going to depend on your mechanisms, needs, to pol uh, policies, and so on. But topologically, there's a particular purpose here. In fact, we can take it further. I control this shared resource. This is my machine, after all. I control it. And, you know, this VPN is bi-directional. 
am I going to hack into my partner? Maybe someone's going to hack me, and I'm going to go after the partner machine. Maybe they don't trust me. Maybe they want a firewall around their end of, of it as well, protecting their end from being used to infect the rest of their company. A lot of the companies you partner with, you're not their only customer, you're not their only client. You're trusting them and everyone they've ever trusted. May, how did the HVAC company in the Target case get hacked? Maybe someone went into a smaller corporate network, hacked the HVAC company, and then used that to hack Target. I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows, but I do know they're not talking. Maybe we need, maybe we need three firewalls in this scenario. Another one right over there. Firewalling can sometimes be implicit. I showed this example earlier. And this design, this is a generic web server. I've seen this diagram many times in security architecture reviews. The primary purpose of this architecture is reliability. Everything is replicated. Dual LANs, dual, multiple web servers, multiple databases, multiple links to the outside. But I've got this inverse proxy load balancer. Load balancing to make sure you should handle the offered load across multiple, you send it to multiple web servers. But they're also measuring the responsiveness of the web server and say, this one is really slow. Maybe it's overloaded, maybe it's crashing. Either way, send the traffic someplace else. As I already indicated, we have the benefit of this firewall not passing any other traffic. The databases are further isolated. There's no web connectivity, no internet connectivity to them except from the rest of the company. But this router complex in the lower right really needs firewalling functionality to protect the databases from the rest of the company. Because if you want to think about what's valuable, what are the assets? The most valuable thing in this diagram is what's on those databases. If a web server, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when a web server got hacked, this could make the front page of the New York Times or Wall Street Journal. Companies been very embarrassed. Their web servers have been hacked, you know? These days, it may end up on the inside pages if anyone bothers to mention it at all. It's just, you know, you go, you, you go find it in strange corners of uh, Twitter or uh, strange mailing lists that so-and-so's web page was defaced. Oh, that again. Detect it, reload, reboot, recover. What's on the databases can make or break your company. It could be the 40 million credit card numbers that were stolen from Target. Or it could be an integrity attack. You know, uh, I heard some years ago about a company who was quite convinced that their one of their competitors had hacked the database with prices of the, of the items that they were selling, making them too low so they'd lose money in every transaction and or too high so no one would want to buy from them. If your databases get corrupted, you're dead. And that's not an easy thing to recover from because this is the information that you're using to run the company. So that is the asset most worth protecting, which means that you, this link really needs to be a firewall to protect it because this is the most valuable asset on that web server complex, not the web server itself. The incidental protective effect of, of the web server, these inverse proxies, is nice, but the web servers aren't important except as a way to get into databases. What do we do about mobile devices that are wandering back and forth across the firewall? 
How do we protect them? And how do we protect an infected mobile device from bringing the infection home? By the way, for, uh, all these slides are going to be on my web page in the next few days. So. There are two different ways to approach mobile devices when it comes to firewalling. One is called split tunneling. So I've got the organization up here in the upper right, the, co the corporation that this laptop wants to connect to, and I've got the internet. You know, this laptop's sitting in a hotel someplace. And with split tunneling, I've got this nice encrypted tunnel back home, but my direct traffic of all the other interesting sites I'm browsing for my amusement when I'm sitting in a lonely hotel room, there is no corporate protection. There's no firewall protection. The advantage of this is performance. I don't want to have to go all the way back here and then out to these other sites. I, it would slow down the connection. It would cause a bottleneck link over here, need more bandwidth. But it exposes the laptop to the rest of the internet. If the firewall is providing any protection, I really want to protect those mobile devices. If we have triangle routing, all of my traffic goes back here and then out to the outside. It would be very, very lovely to be able to configure laptops and so on, not to be able to talk to the outside directly at all, but only to be able to talk through this encrypted tunnel back home. Unfortunately, almost every hotel I've stayed at wants me to go click through some advertising website and read the terms and conditions that I haven't read. So I have to be able to talk to the outside to set, in order to be able to set up this link. There's an, it's an interesting exercise for how you would build a high assurance system that would handle that correctly. Anyone want to take a try? How, what would you do? You want to set this up. Yeah. Use a yes, very good. Use a virtual machine or some other firewalled off portion of the laptop whose sole purpose is to get access to the internet. And then you can set up this tunnel and everything else can browse. It gets a little bit more complicated, but that's fundamentally the right strategy. Again, we're using firewall like technology. In that case, an internal firewall on this machine, an internal virtual machine whose sole purpose is to log you on to the hotel network and then let you get out to the world to set up your encrypted tunnel and get all the protective benefits, such as of the organizational firewall. But again, this is costing performance. You know, and here in Israel, what, 12,000 kilometers from home, speed of light lag alone is going to hurt me if I want to go look at Israeli resources. And even Google can't increase the speed of light to improve, uh, to improve that. Uh, maybe Bell Labs could have, but they laid off most of their physicists, so they're not going to do it. So it's, uh, there's the bottleneck, there's the inherent latency problem. But how important is the security? You know, I'm an academic without any particular corporate secrets these days. I care more about the VPN protection when I'm on a public wireless network. But. So we can do split tunnel routing, or we can do this triangle routing. And now the device comes home. It was exposed to the outside and maybe got infected, like those dozen or so code red laptops at the IETF that I mentioned. And then the question is, what does this laptop that has now come home need to access inside the organization? Sometimes the answer is little to nothing. There are a lot of people who take a laptop when they're traveling just to be able to read their email, maybe a little bit of web surfing. The best thing to do with a laptop like that is wipe its disk. Call them burner laptops. Important people who go to dubious countries are sometimes given burner laptops. And they're either wiped or carefully examined, depending on the organization, when they get home. New York Times article a few years ago on uh, 
what, gov what U.S. government officials or high corporate executives often do when visiting China. China's a well-known company for doing things like this. Not just laptops. I, I heard a story a few years ago. Uh, someone who is living in the United States was actually a Portuguese uh, citizen. Visited China, called home, was talking to his family, and just switched to Portuguese. Language of the of his house. And suddenly a voice broke in, speak English, please. <laughs> Sometimes you want to go wipe the laptop. I, uh, I know of one organization that carefully fingerprints devices before they go abroad and does it again when they get home and looks for changes. I said, ask the guy, have, do you ever find anything suspicious? Oh, yeah. Really? To which countries? <laughs> you can imagine the list. Sometimes, though, the laptop, you don't want to wipe it. It's not been in a high-threat environment. What you want to do is, uh, but it's still needing it. The employee is going to take it home to keep reading email at home, maybe work on a document or two. So maybe you put it permanently on the outside of the corporation. All it has access to internally is, you know, the corporate mail server and maybe, uh, you know, the personnel department web server and you log your vacation time or the like. It doesn't need access to lots of corporate resources for this class of laptop. Now, there are people for whom they do, you know. Uh, my laptop is my primary machine. I've been using my laptop as my primary machine for more than 20 years. Uh, I'd much rather lose my desktop than my laptop because it has a lot less interest on it. Can't protect all things that way. But if the class of laptop is one that's comparatively casual use, the documents you need to work on during the email and so on, maybe it leave, lives outside the corporate network with a firewall policy resources. And then, by the way, you don't have to worry if your corporate Wi-Fi network is that secure, because this is the external network, or a semi-external network. Defenses will fail. The next layer is intrusion detection. Intrusion detection systems I have a colleague who works on IDSs, and uh, one way of looking at it is, he succeeds because I have failed. My job is to build secure systems, or design secure systems, that keep the bad guys out, and his job is to detect when the bad guys have gotten in anyway. So you need an IDS, and there are two basic types, two detection approaches, signature-based and anomaly detection, and two basic types, network and host. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here. Signature detection has, relies on a database of known problems. Most antivirus programs work this way. Here is the way this piece of malware behaves. We will look for it. It cannot detect a new kind of attack because, by definition, a new kind of attack is not in the database. Anomaly detectors, on the other hand, look for unusual patterns of behavior. How do you know what's unusual? You train the system on normal behavior when you're not infected, assuming that is you know when you're not infected. But the big advantage of an anomaly detector is it can pick up a zero-day attack because it's still unusual. It's going to look abnormal. Of course, what is normal today is different from what is normal tomorrow. You need to read that. You know, some days I'm, uh, I'm intensively writing, uh, you know, I spent this whole summer finishing my book, so I was doing very le little other than LaTeX and web browsing when I needed to check resources. Sometimes I write code. Sometimes I grade homework assignments. What I'm doing from day to day will vary. 
it's hard to tell the difference between abnormal because there's an attack or abnormal because the legitimate users are doing something different. Oh my God, there's a spike in traffic. We must, have, we must be under a DDoS attack. No, uh, our web server's got something that got mentioned in Slashdot. Now everybody is poking at it, trying to retrieve this, new, this, uh, this file. Is it an attack? No, we're popular. But we can pick up zero days with an anomaly detector, which you cannot pick up with a signature-based system. Where do you put your intrusion detection systems? Sometimes you put them on your host computers. The big advantage of putting it on the host computer is you don't have to worry about the cryptography. You receive an encrypted e piece of email that's got a virus inside the encryption. Your mail gateway can't look at this. It's encrypted. But I will decrypt it. The antivirus software can go look at it then. Can't read this SSL traffic. It's, it's encrypted. No problem. I can do it at one end of the connection or the other. On the other hand, if the host is hacked, the anti-intrusion detection software can be disabled. Virus writers know how to do things like this. The, one of the first things they do is disable logging software and antivirus updates. This is old behavior by these uh, things. Root kits to let them hide from intrusion detection. Very common and very old technology in the malware community. So putting that the host is a good thing for some purposes, but is vulnerable to other kinds of attacks. If we put the IDS in the network, we're just monitoring the packets that are going by. I, can't, I cannot deal with encryption, but I'm in much better shape to pick, to, uh, pick up network level probes, why am I getting an ARP request from that, an ARP response from that port over there when I know that that IP address belongs over there? You cannot pick that up easily at the host level. And it's not susceptible to being hacked. You hack this host, my IDS can still pick it up. So this is a network level IDS. And where do we put the sensors for the network IDS? It turns out that the best spot to put them are at, this, at these topological choke points. The same kinds of places where we would put firewalls. Whether it's a point firewall or an enterprise firewall doesn't matter as much. This is a place that the traffic is going to have to go through. Yeah, I've infected one machine inside a department going after another. Gateway to the outside, sensor will not detect it any more than if somebody tries to steal data and export it, I'll pick it up that way. So we can have departmental intrusion detection systems the same way we can have departmental firewalls. It's the same sort of topology and the same sort of properties. We have an interesting duel, though. Where do the policies come from? For a departmental firewall, the policies are probably local. For an intrusion detection system, the sensor is local, but I really want central correlation. So it's not quite the same thing. It's got the same topological property. In fact, all three of the properties that I mentioned for firewalls, I've only got good guys on the inside normally generating malicious traffic. My traffic is passing through. There's one class of traffic that the IDS has to be looking for. The same three properties that apply to firewalls apply to intrusion detection systems and have to be treated accordingly. In fact, let's go all the way back to that very distributed firewall I talked about earlier, which is on the individual computer. I can do intrusion detection. That's a host-based IDS. It's exactly what a host-based IDS is. It's the personalized version of it. I want central policies on what's normal and abnormal. I want central monitoring, just as I want central policies shipped out to the firewall module. This is the way we can detect these tunnels. 
somebody sending IP over HTTP. It doesn't look like HTTP. This is not what HTTP traffic looks like. An IDS properly tuned can detect it. It doesn't even have to know that it's tunneling. It just knows. This is the distribution of packet sizes, of directions of flow, of packet timings for HTTP. If it suddenly starts looking very different, it's either really strange HTTP or maybe it's something more serious. What is it? That's investigation. That's a separate issue. I'm not talking about forensics today, but a good network anomaly detector will spot this. And yeah, then the sophistication. We can take another step. We can go to an intrusion prevention system. Sometimes I heard described as an IDS with an attitude. An intrusion prevention system looks at traffic, traffic that's allowed to flow, broadly speaking, by policy. Here is something going towards the web server. It's port 80, it's allowed to go to the web server. Port 25 towards the mail server. This is permissible according to policy. The firewall can't block this. But something about the traffic looks strange. Oh, this recipient name, it's 17,000 characters long. That's characteristic of a such and such attack. And it just goes and says, okay, I will send a TCP reset packet down this pipe, thank you. And where do we put these things? Again, we put them the same kinds of places where we put firewalls. The same place that the traffic has to pass through. It becomes a component of the firewall. The firewall is blocking some stuff, inspecting everything else, and reacting to something allowed through is not correct. 20 years ago, I, or uh, some others, had fun putting intrusion detection, what today we call IDS, on the outside of the firewall. See what nasty stuff there is on the internet coming at us. 20 years ago, that was an interesting research question. In fact, my first paper on that was Hey, there's bad stuff out there on the internet. I don't think that that kind of investigation is particularly worth doing today. We know there's bad stuff out there on the internet, thank you. The average corporation has no interest whatsoever. You want to know what's getting through, not what you're blocking. The last piece of the puzzle for generic organizational defense is an extrusion. Trying to find people who are stealing your corporate data. This is what would have worked on WikiLeaks. Why are 250,000 cables suddenly going to this one place in Iraq? Why is this one army base suddenly that interested in what the State Department would say? This is what might have worked against them. Uh, whether you think he was right or wrong, the NSA does not think he was right. <coughs> there have been press reports, I don't know how accurate, but Hawaii was the last spot where they're going to put this extrusion detection. I don't know. They don't tell me what they're doing. Remember that I said you can have internal firewalls as well. This means that you can have internal intrusion and extrusion detection. You put these sensors wherever you would or could or do put a firewall. This is your last ditch defense. Someone has gotten in, you haven't detected stop them. They're doing strange stuff, you haven't really detected it. But now they're stealing your data. You know, corporate data's got this very interesting characteristic. It tends to be large. If you go back to the literature 30 years and more, Covert channels, something the military is worried about. Strange, non canonical ways of uh, communicating. You can't always eliminate these covert channels. But one of the requirements is you can't eliminate that. 
you can rate limit them. The bandwidth of a Colbert channel must be no more than 300 bits or seconds or some such. Extrusion detection is saying, OK, the rate of information transfer out of here has gotten abnormally large. We are sending out things we're not supposed to send out. We can even do it uh, more interestingly. A colleague of mine has worked on uh, called Honey Documents, Honey Docs. What is it? It's a Word file. It's a PDF file. When you open it, it makes a network request. It's easy to put URLs and say into uh, PDF documents, and scripts into Word documents. So somebody puts this in there. Yes? I have a question about the students. Yes? Um, we've been talking about the whole lecture about network and IT, but this is going far more higher. Extrusion, extrusion detection is, is usually, but not always, the very top of the stack. And you need to know who is doing very broad queries against the database. Who's doing it? Who's doing it when? And block it. Who's doing it? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who's doing a copy from the file system? Very large. Yeah, Who, who's doing the copy? This is a high level requirement. And sometimes you're going to do it in a policy fashion. So and so is not, is not allowed to, document, to download more than seven documents a week because that's what this person's job description typically entails. Or you can, or you can do it the same way you do anomaly detection and say, okay, I have trained my extrusion detection to so see what normal is, and the rate has suddenly increased. And maybe the rate has suddenly increased because there's an attacker, and maybe the rate is suddenly increased because there's a new corporate initiative, and I'm suddenly engaged in negotiations with some outside company to bring them documents, uh, and it's perfectly legitimate. It's got the strengths and weaknesses of any anomaly detection system. You've got to. You get false positives, you've got to train it, you'll sometimes do different things. But the point is that you can react. One of the very fine points of anomaly detection uh, extrusion detection, any sort of intrusion detection, is how do you react? You want to keep the false alarm rate low enough that you're not spending too much people time investigating these things while well, still giving up the really serious one. It's not an easy balance. And uh, there are long stories about somebody doing nasty things. Oh, that links the behaving against this attack again. And finally, it's a false alarm. Let me shut it down. It's Friday, I want to go home. And that's when the attack happens. Uh, it's an old, old story. You just get who are the attackers and how good are they? What are they likely to try? That sort of thing is an example of a targeted attack. Can you relate to database problems? Volume, uh, incredible database problems. This is what they're doing. They're yeah. Doing. Yeah. High-end systems are looking for this sort of thing. This is you know, this is not a research book. I'm not describing my research, my research here. Uh, but this is it is not an easy problem. This is just part of a total defensive uh, uh, picture. You know, there are banks out there that have fake bank accounts whose details have been left in various places. Why? Because if anybody ever tries to withdraw money from those accounts, then they know that something has gone wrong. And they have to investigate further. You know, my university has internally, this is a university, very loose security policies, has internal sensors to pick, question, uh, has internal sensors to look for uh, scanning Network scanning behavior from the inside, so either a misbehaving student or a more likely an infected machine. And if it picks up too much odd behavior, it isolates that person's computer. They get shifted up off onto a separate VLAN where everything they try gets to a web page saying your machine's infected. Here's a link to Microsoft and Apple patches and antivirus software. And until you've cleaned up your machine, we're not going to re enable your, uh, your machine for network access. I, I tripped one of these anomaly detectors once. Uh, it looked like I was trying to get to the mail, sending mail,
from eight different autonomous systems in one day. They thought that someone had stolen my login and was using it to send spam. Well, no, I was playing around with the VPN and I was traveling. <laughs> I tried from my house, the VPN wasn't working right, I tried from my house, airport lounge, New York airport, got to the meeting, got to my hotel, to two or three different VPN servers, and I tripped it. Fortunately, the person who looked at it said, okay, this is Steve Bellman. He's more likely to be doing something strange than have an infected machine dropping out. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, this is not easy, and this is one of the things you've got to tune your system for. But it's part of the cult of defense. Firewalls alone will not do it today the way they did. You know, near the way they did it 20 years ago. Literally, even 20 years ago, Bill and I were looking at intrusion detection. Ultimately, for firewalls, I want a distributed firewall. It's something I described in the paper about 15 years ago. A device for enforcing policy, where every machine is enforcing the policy by itself. We don't have the choke points, but we still need policy, we still need monitoring and reporting and analysis. And we can use the cryptographic identity of the machine rather than the topological identity to decide who's inside or who's outside. This is not yet done full scale the way I described it, but there's no reason that it couldn't. Everything is a VPN. And that's how we have new policies. So the modern firewall philosophy, <laughs> the classic Guard at the front door firewall by itself does not work anymore, will not work in the future against serious threats. We still have central policies, we still need central policies, and we still need to keep the bad guys away from the buggy code. So we need new styles, new ways of using firewalls that preserve the advantages while coping with the fact that our tech Technology has changed. Our business needs have changed in terms of the very large scale connectivity and the mobile devices that we have. <coughs> yeah? Can you go back to the next generation firewall? I'm sorry? Next generation firewall. Next generation firewall. <laughs> the firewalls that I have seen, most of the commercial firewalls are still depend on those three problems. I call them a theory of firewalls for a reason. Unless you find some design for firewall that doesn't rely on those three properties, I don't think it's going to be tremendously effective. If you distribute it more in ways that cope with this, with like hundreds of thousands of links through your firewall and with mobile code, then you've got something that works. Next generation sounds like a marketing term. I want to know what it does in terms of Dealing with, with coming back to those three farmers, finding a way to preserve it. Yeah? What the implicit assumptions do you think that cloud computing virtualization has? So, cloud computing, you know, I'm an old timer. To me, cloud computing looks, looks like a time sharing service bureau. <laughs> Been there, done that. Uh, it's, uh, I actually am, I'm actually more fond of cloud computing than some people. Uh, or that you might think I would be. And the reasons are several fold. One, okay, first of all, cloud is a very ill-defined term, and you can, it could be anything from bare metal or virtual machine up to, here's a web service instance that we will give you. You know something? A lot of these companies running these cloud services are better system administrators than most people, especially in small companies. If I'm the IT person for a small company, I'm much better off buying web hosting from someplace else. Because I don't have the skills to keep up with this, and they're doing it at scale. They've got the tools and the skills in the background, and the monitoring and everything else. They will benefit from the uh, bandwidth. You know, I saw a news report a few years ago about, on, on the ground, about two guys attacks, and step 17. Uh, the terminator target is web servers, host on the Amazon cloud. If so, don't bother DDoS, and they've got more bandwidth than you can generate, uh, more CPU capacity, and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages to the cloud. Uh, 
On the other hand, it's a very, very attractive target. Yeah. If I break into a major cloud provider, I've got lots of stuff. And maybe Amazon or Google or Microsoft or the target of a very sophisticated attacker who wouldn't be going after me, but I'm collateral damage. They've broken in there, now they've got all my data. So there's no one answer. Generally speaking, the smaller the company, the less sophisticated the company, the more they will benefit from higher level cloud services. Virtual machines, virtual machines are a useful tool, but you've got to understand their limits. You know, uh, let's take it to the ultimate. A separate physical machine. If you invite your enemy to put their physical machine in a rack in your data and connect to your land and your data center, I think most companies would say, no way. Well, that's what, a, that's what a VM is. It's a machine. A VM is an economic device. It may be strong isolation from the host system, but two VMs on the same land, well, they can still attack each other. A virtual copy of Windows needs just as good an antivirus system as a real copy of Windows. And the software can, be, can still be just as buggy. The other thing, and this gets again, a little bit more philosophical, it's actually a completely different talk uh, than what I finally did here, but uh, most of our security mechanisms are based on what I call walls and doors. And we're really good at building strong walls. It's not perfect. There have been problems with VM hacks through the hypervisor and so on. But roughly speaking, we're pretty good at building strong walls. Remember what I said this morning about you don't go through strong security and go around it. Well, the weakness in the wall is the door. We want to let certain things through. In order to let certain things through, we need two things. We need a policy and we need an enforcement. And we can have flaws in both of those. And that's where most security failings happen. If you look, say, at Unix systems about what the security failures have been over the decades, there have been very, very few failures involving system calls or the kernel user space boundary. Not none, but very few. Almost all the problems we have are with privileged programs, the SENUID programs. They have policies, but they've been granted privileges. They can pass through the door, but their implementation is, is flawed, and they allow other bad things to happen. Uh, in fact, the whole paradigm of trusted, untrusted, has not worked any better on single computers than is it has more than firewall good bad works today. Because, okay, let me go back to 1988 when the Morris worm hit. And uh, I mean, you familiar with the Orange Book. The Orange Book originally came out in 1983. US, the official uh, wrote something like the US Department of Defense Guide to Trusted Computer System Evaluation. How do you build a trusted computer? system. Uh, well, this is what DOD wanted for systems that could support untrusted users, uncleared users, and top secret traffic. And it was really saying, we were going to build a giant time sharing machine that has all levels of, of users on it, all levels of data. Never mind that it was exactly the wrong time to really strengthen time sharing systems because they're about to go away for a few decades. PCs, and before we came back to cloud computing. Uh, the, uh, but then the Morris worm hit. In his aftermath, I went and reread the orange book, which is still considered pretty current and pretty relevant. I went to someone older and wiser in ways of security and said, there's nothing in the orange book that would have stopped it. This was a disturbing concept. It was the guy to your computer system, and I didn't see anything that would have stopped the Mars worm. Oh no, Steve, a level B2 system would have stopped it. How so? And I recited the property of a B2 system. Oh, the B2 system requires a thorough search for bugs. <laughs> well, I was fairly new to operating computer security then, then, but even then I knew that he was not correct. That was not going to work. Uh, the flaws that the, that, that worm exploited, many, many other flaws since then have all been at one level. 
How do we build our gates in such a way that we really can trust it? We're seeing it somewhat the same. We have sandbox. It's come back, and we're going to run our browser or our PDF viewer in a sandbox. And these sandboxes have been very, very porous. Why? Because the doors have to be very wide, because we have to do a lot of things to it. The browser still has to be able to save files and like open the Word documents or PDF documents. I've got to be able to click on mail to URLs and have the browser sandbox talk to the mailer sandbox. I have a very broad policy. It's very, very hard to get these things right, both the specification and implementation. So cloud is a good thing in many cases, but it's another way of having walls. Outsourcing, you know, modern corporations outsource a tremendous amount of their, their functioning anyway. I was surprised when I published my first book to learn that publishers don't own printing presses. That's something they outsource. That's not their job anymore. The cleaning crew mops the floor in your computer rooms. It's probably outsourced to a janitorial room. Target has this air conditioning company running their ventilation system. Many things are outsourced. Why shouldn't your computer operations be outsourced? It may not be the right thing from a security perspective. It may be the right thing. But it's not a question that's easily answered in the abstract. It's a very, very particular question depending on your specific security needs, your specific abilities, and who your right enemies are, and how good the cloud provider is. So no one is, I tell my students, my favorite answer is it depends. Cloud is very much the case of that. Other questions? 